thank you all of you for coming here to hear us. It's much appreciated. WOTR stands for the Watershed Organization Trust. It's an NGO basically. And what I'm going to be sharing with you today is the experiences of this NGO in various large scale programs, but focused on climate change adaptation. Currently, we are in six states of the country, and in terms of watershed development, supporting projects in about 1.8 million acres, and on our own, in about 800,000 acres of our own. The number of, we are a capacity building agency, besides also implementing projects directly, and to date, in terms of training, capacity building, we've supported over 320,000 people from 27 countries and 26 states of my own country. We are also a group of uh, three organizations, actually four, uh, on top over there, doing different things and all spun off from water. These are the various sectors or thematics that we are engaged in. The reason I'm putting this down is to emphasize the point that if you really want to build adaptive capacities, you need to approach the issue in a multi-sectoral and multi-dimensional context and framework. Because when you look at people, their livelihoods and their lives, and communities for that matter, it's all these various drivers that actually impact their quality of life, as well as the degree to which you can build their resilience and help them to adapt to climate change. So we should not look at simply one sector and focus on that. We need to look at the multiplicity of sectors that actually impact people's lives and with which they are interacting and dealing with simultaneously. This is the context of our work. We work only in rain fed areas, dry land areas, which as you know are already impacted by climate change, market forces, and a depleted natural resource base, leaving behind fractured and vulnerable communities. So this is our constituency and this is our target group. These are the problems that we try to address, lack of firewood, lack of drinking water, uh, malnourished children. In fact, you know, India has got about 46% of our children malnourished, and lack of fodder and water for cattle. So these are the challenges, some of the challenges that we face. <clears throat> to address this, we have developed what we call as the water engine for adaptive sustainable development. And we focus on the five capitals. And we believe that if you develop them simultaneously or to the extent possible, then you move inwards towards security, material adequacy, and ultimately this is the goal, which is wholeness. That's what all of us are finally striving for. But you need to have a framework in which to situate and assess or measure your activities and their impact. Watershed development, we believe ecosystems management is the hanger on which you can hang many of the other developmental interventions that you do. So that for us is the basis of our interventions. The idea being that, as I told you, in dryland areas, water is the limiting factor. So if you can trap rainwater, for us, the only real water we have is rain. It falls in four months in the year, but actually speaking, we don't have more than 10 to 15 days of rainy, rainy days when you have what is called harvestable rainwater. So if you don't catch that rainwater in those 15 days, then you're in trouble for the rest of the year. And the idea of watershed development is water that is running, you slow it down. Water that you've slowed down, you make it walk. And walking water, you stop. And water that you have stopped, you force it underground. So how do you do that? Right from the ridge line, these are the valleys. These are the ridge lines and the valleys. Right from the top, you do a series of mechanical, vegetative, and bi biological treatments that basically impede the flow of water, arrest erosion, and slow running water, catch rain basically wherever it falls. That's the idea of watershed development. And you do a number of, uh, of treatment. These are continuous contour trenches on which you do plantation, both of trees and grasses. As you come to the farmlands, you do compartment bundings. Along the drainage line, you do what is called stone buns and gully plugs. If you notice, the whole idea is to create barriers to rushing water, because that's what actually the whole ecosystem is based on, the hydrological flows. Now, along the drainage line, we focus on, of course, gabion structures, earthen nullabunds, mason reveres, percolation tanks, then water harvesting structures, and changes in land use. Water, that's the essence to adaptation and resilience building. And so for now, it's not enough that you harvest. What I had shown you earlier was harvesting rainwater. But today, we need to look at productivity of water. It's not enough to get product maximum output per, per piece of land but as much crop or output per drop of water. So for us, getting communities to handle water budgeting, to assess how much of rain fell, how much water they have, you need to train them in water budgeting. Then as you know, water agriculture is the largest consumer of water. So you need to match crop water requirements with available water, practice environmentally safe agriculture, as well as focus on soil health, deploy water conservation technologies. These are very key 
that is integrated water pest and nutrient management. In other words, basically, adaptation today calls for a very fairly high level of scientific knowledge and application. It's not rocket science, but it has to be demystified, but there's no escaping the key driver or input of knowledge in making agriculture sustainable and viable. And of course, you demonstrated seeing is believing, so farmer field schools play a key thing. These are some of the, some of the examples of what we do. Basically, these are water, uh, enhancing, water efficiency enhancing technologies. We've developed automated content management systems to provide agro-advisories to farmers, demonstrations on the field, competition among farmers to spread replication effort and foster peer-to-peer -peer learning. This is an important component in our interventions, the agrometrology, because in monsoonic climates and all over the world, local weather conditions are no longer as they were 10 years ago. They have changed. And that, of course, affects farmers because now they are faced with a situation that they were never confronted with in the past. And so they have to learn new ways of handling new problems for the same old crops and methods that they were using in the past. So we have developed a whole metrological package or system wherein weather information is put on the, on the village boards, shared with the farmers, and they are trained to understand what it's all about. But here is the heart of it all. In India, we have the Indian Metrological Department, which is actually the service that provides ag uh, weather advisories to farmers. So what we have done is we have linked up with them, in which we have got about 51 agromat stations, which are telemetry linked, 29 of them are telemetry linked to this institution, it's a government institution, scientific institution. And they get this on an hourly basis, <coughs> weather advice, uh, weather information from the villages themselves. And they give us, in return, on a daily basis, a weather forecast on a three-day basis, three-day cycle. On that, depending on the crops grown in those areas and the soil types and the farmer conditions, we have developed an automated content management system that matches these weather advisories to crop requirements. And we bundle them together as a crop, uh, crop agro-advisory, as we call crop weather advisory. And you can notice we use GIS, remote sensing, as well as uh, people's uh, traditional knowledge. We then shoot it out to the farmers in three ways. One is through mobile SMS technology, where that is not prevalent or effective, then we have wallpapers and public address systems which give information to farmers. Once they are tried, tested, feedback is generated, and then we reconfigure the knowledge module. So this we found very interesting and very helpful because it gives farmers a lot more assurance into how to handle the changing weather patterns that they are experiencing. In addition to that, from the perspective of upscaling and replication, because we don't do anything unless it can be upscaled, we have developed a number of tools, the latest of which has been already released. It's on the web. And that is this core drive, which is actually helps communities to identify their vulnerability and actually plan measures that will enhance their adaptive capacity and reduce risk. A number of other tools which will also be released, freely available on the web which will be supported by software programs so that you don't have to redo everything and analyze the data again. It will be, you just have to upload it on the web and you'll get reports generated uh, based on the system and the location you are in. It's primarily uh, adapted for India at present, but eventually we will be expanding it. What are the impacts? Take a look at this village. The rainfall pattern here is about 300 to 400 millimeters. That's semi-arid, almost near desert conditions. In 1996, when we began the project, the total output in the village was, say, about 10 million rupees. By the time they finished this project, it was almost 6 million rupees, so it increased phenomenally. Uh, 16, uh, sorry, 60 million rupees, it's six times more. Now, the key thing was this community would migrate for six months in the year because there was no water in the village. There was nothing on which you could survive. The good news is after all these years, the people have not only come back, they have actually, well, Poverty has gone down so dramatically, it's difficult now to identify the same people who once we saw as poor, as poor today. The point I'm trying to make is when you do environmental regeneration along watershed lines well, in an integrated, multi-sectoral approach involving the community living in those watersheds, the impacts are transformative. This is actually a, a, a watershed of 1,500 hectares, about 15 square kilometers. If you look at the red, this is false color composite. Look how it looks just three years later when you do watershed development. So the forestry, the biomass has increased phenomenally. We did a study and look at the amount of impacts just in after about two to three years of work. It's substantial and it's long lasting because you know, once you get water right, the rest follows. <clears throat> These are some of the pictures which actually 
show how uh, the water situation has changed dramatically. And once that happens, there is a massive diversification of livelihoods as well as um, income generating activities. And formerly it was only agriculture, now it is uh, floriculture, application of new technologies, non-farm activities, livestock, the whole works. Some of the policy impacts, as I mentioned, that we do not take up anything unless it has the potential to be upscaled and taken up by government or national actors. So these are some of the things that uh, we managed to do, S set up a huge fund in India, which is now taking this across the country, to develop methods called the net planning, which has been adopted in government programs. Uh, you know, in India, to treat forest land is important because it occupies the top of the watershed. So we got permission to treat that, and many of the approaches and techniques that we developed are now mainstreamed in national programs. How is it done? At the, S, the heart of it is people. So we deal with village institutions. We do not replace them. We may add to them, but we don't replace them. And we get them to work and do what they're meant to do. And so we use a lot of systems dynamics, I mean systems approach, and so we use a lot of technology, but that's at our end. So satellite imaging, GIS, and we can tell you actually, this is a cadastral map. Cadastral map is actually the land holding pattern in a village. Using GSM phones, we can tell you on each piece of land what we are going to do, how much it's going to cost, the time frame, and how much the farmer is going to contribute. In other words, you can track on every parcel or piece of land what is the present status, what is going to be done, how it's going to be costed, and you can follow this right through a project period. And you need to use technology for that. Now take this piece of land, say number 59, survey number 59. See the type of crops that are growing on that. You need to track this down if you're going to give actually crop and locale specific weather advisories. For instance, if a farmer is growing, say for instance, wheat, he wouldn't want to get from your advisories that are particular to potatoes. You need to give him advice for wheat. But here's the trick. He's growing it on land which probably has got three types of qualifications. Could be a light soil, could be deep soil, could be medium soil. There are different advices to be given for these conditions, which is an automated IT supported program. Take this for instance. Uh, this is a village. And this is how it looked in December 1992. Now, if you look at this, it's December 1992, it's December 2000, and December 2011. The rainfall for all these three seasons is comparable. It was around 500 millimeters. Now, this red is a false color composite, which actually tells you the vegetation, the biomass. It's greenery, actually. This was before we started work. Look at that in 2000, and look at it now. So in the same rainfall, you can see the impact of watershed development. And this has been the huge changes that have taken place. Now, obviously, if you can see the economic status of communities have improved phenomenally. To that extent, their vulnerability index has gone down, and their capacity to, and the ability to take risks and to mitigate risk has gone up also correspondingly. So the point is you need to have a holistic approach to building capacities, both adaptive as well as mitigated. Uh, you need many partners, you can't do this alone. So obviously we have several partners and what I've shared with you is also the experiences in different, uh, different parts and amounts of three major programs. One is the Climate Change Adaptation Program, which is supported by the Swiss Development Corporation and NABAD, which is a government bank. The Indo-German Watershed Development Program, which was funded by the KFW and the GTZ, in those days now GIZ. These are some of the private parties involved with us as well as governments. So you need to bring a multiplicity of stakeholders who complement the effort and who share the same interests together. And that's also part of the challenge of managing such projects, if you want to go to scale. You need also knowledge partners, particularly if they are national knowledge institutions, like we are dealing with ICRAF, for instance, the Indian Meteorological Department, state agriculture universities, central institutions, as well as private institutions. So you need to bring a whole uh, group of people and institutions together. What are my concluding remarks? You see climate change in rural areas impacts ecosystems, water, uh, livelihoods, and economic activities. Now, all of these are rooted in and interact across watersheds. So in rural, rural India, or rural contexts, people are all living in watersheds. And that's where actually the impacts of a variable climate play out. So you need to look the geographical unit for interventions in building adaptive capacities must, in my opinion and submission, be the watershed. Now, you can define them from a few hectares to millions of hectares, but practically, it's good to define it between 500 hectares to 1,500 hectares. That's manageable. Or at least in what we call the space of survival of the community. Where people are living and what they consider their area of survival, that would be a good enough watershed to start with. 
Secondly, if you need to build capacities, you need to see the interrelationships between all these various components, that's livestock, water, agriculture, livelihoods, how they interact with the landscapes, with the community dynamics, and with a wider market framework around which they're living, in which they're living, and to see exactly where exactly is the vulnerabilities, what are the risks, and how do we actually mitigate them. Those various tools I had showed you earlier, they're actually meant to address several levels of these gaps or vulnerabilities. And the third and last is therefore, if you really I mean, do what we call landscape management along watershed lines. Now, why watershed lines? Because often, for us, watershed, for people, watershed development is basically a landscape affair. It's just land and soil and water conservation. But actually, it is the hydrology of a place that keeps a community there or actually disperses them. If there's no water, a community packs up and migrates. So when you talk of watershed development, you need to keep not only the conservation perspective of the ecosystem, but also the hydrological perspective. So you need to talk of not only landscape management, you need to talk of improved water use efficiency. Because we learned through the hard way is that it's not enough that you make water available. More important after that is how people use it. You could have a situation where actually they could become even worse off after watershed development than when you started off if they simply do water mining which is a danger when people get come into water without knowing how to manage it efficiently. So improving the efficiency of water is key to building adaptive capacities. It's not enough that you produce more and cleverly and better. It's also important that you get more value for that you produce. In other words, from the farm gate to the plate, the entire value chain is something that we need to look at. And lastly, of course, market access. For the farmer is key because unless he realizes better value for his produce in terms of better incomes, it's not likely that he would be willing to accept the discipline as well as pay the price of doing things better and more sustainably. Thank you. As you said, they're catching the rain everywhere. That's the theme and the motto of an adaptive program. Catch the rain wherever it falls. Thank you. The first question was how applicable or replicable this is in other contexts in different countries, if I got that correct. I think it's perfectly replicable wherever. You'll have to modify it and to suit local conditions, both uh, economic and social conditions, as well as the particular geographic conditions in which you're working. But in principle, in terms of, uh, of the method and approach, it's applicable everywhere. Maybe the sequencing will change. The emphasis on various uh, sets of activities will change, but largely Wherever rain falls and wherever people are living, it can work. So one of the key learnings we did was uh, we assumed that once water came, people would use it wisely. I wouldn't assume that so easily anymore. I would start with the assumption that once water comes, it's going to be exploited badly. So how do we already start thinking of systems that can maximize, optimize, rather than maximize, optimize the productive potential of the water, ex the incremental water you get, Without yielding, I mean, leading a community into water mining. Because, you know, in these areas, the largest catchment of water is groundwater. In fact, Indian agriculture is as much as 60 to 70 percent dependent on groundwater. Now, watershed development basically raises the groundwater levels, recharges aquifers, raises the, the groundwater tables. Now, the challenge is, I mean, I mean, people have not had enough water over a lifetime and for generations. When they get suddenly this availability of water, we all know what happens when we come into something new for the first time, we splurge. One of the things we would do is already starting at the very beginning, introduce concepts, practices like water budgeting, for instance, and then matching it to crop water requirements in a way that optimizes yields per drop of water at the same time does not yield to uh, result in environmentally unsustainable agricultural practices. Because with water comes in the need to use fertilizers, pesticides, and then your whole issue of soil health starts getting affected, including the environment. So we would relook at it differently from these end outcomes that we want now. Okay. The next point that I, the question was, how do you, re about groundwater management? Yeah. In India, of course, groundwater is a private good. Unless there is a, a calamity like drought, for instance, when the government can actually impound water sources and then make it available to the community. Otherwise, unlike minerals where below three feet it belongs to the government, water is actually a private good. However, 
Of late now, government is thinking seriously of ways of how to regulate it. They're going to be doing a national groundwater survey soon, but the point is this. Um, one of the reasons why it becomes difficult to create sustainable water markets is in a context or a regime of uncertainty, how does a farmer or the owner of that water, how does he know how much he really has and therefore how much he can share or at what point should he stop extracting because the extraction rate is higher than the recharge rate. So unless we are able to develop robust, reliable models for assessing groundwater flows, it will be quite difficult in my opinion to regulate groundwater in a way that can be enforced consistently, number one. Number two, to be able to even develop robust water markets, you need to have a fairly consistent and reliable uh, amount of electricity. Now imagine a situation where uh, power can be off the grid. I mean, there's no electricity for 12 hours. Then what, what is the incentive to the farmer uh, to, to, to regulate his, his water flow? What he does is he keeps the, 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 the pump. It's all of them are sub water pumps, I mean, under, underwater grounds. He keeps it on. Now that's most foolish in terms both of extraction as well as energy use. So you need to have also reliable and known consistent supply of electricity. And thirdly, he also needs to know when he has, supposing he has both these, he knows how much water is there, he knows that when he will get what type of electricity, how much crop water is really required. So he, you know, it, at the bottom of it, unless we can get the uncertainty out of decision making opportunities with regard to groundwater, only then, in my opinion, you can really develop effective legislation which can be enforced. So you need to go, if you want to avoid tokenism, then you need to develop good science. The last question was crop, uh, yes, about uh, crop biodiversity. Crop adaptation, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as you know, the green revolution has also been, in one way, very good. On the other hand, it also led to the replacement of local varieties with very standardized crops like wheat and rice. It has its purpose, it has its value, but today there's an awareness growing that we need to go back to crop biodiversity, you know, agrobiodiversity. Agro and we emphasize and focus a lot on indigenous land races. We promote them in a big way. And we found that if you use very simple methods, the productivity of these indigenous races can increase substantially. Now, it may well be that you need to do applied technology to improve their productivity, creating maybe better improved seeds, maybe even high yielding varieties. We're not against that. But we are saying preserve what you have, optimize its potential, and then develop it further using science. Uh, this is important because if you look at the perspective from food sovereignty, you need to have people masters of their own seeds because that's the only way in which you can assure access to it without having to be taken to court, you know. So for us, it's important that you develop seed banks in the villages using local varieties and optimizing the production. We would very much focus on that. That's why we have gone into biodiversity as a specific intervention in an adaptive strategy. Because we realize that in, in our area, when India is one of the biodiversity hotspots, we have a very rich uh, flora and fauna. And uh, many species of agriculture value actually have in them genes that are quite often well suited to addressing raising, rising temperatures, uh, fluctuations in rainfall, and even scarcity. Salt tolerance, for instance. Now, these are available in the wild. We need them to identify them. We need to ensure that the rights to those races reside in the communities. And then, if you need to exploit them commercially, you should in a way that the benefits come back to the communities that provided that. And one of the good things in India is we have the Bioconservation Act, or what they call the People's Biodiversity Register. We are working with the People's Biodiversity Register in a big way so that what, is, what belongs to a community is recorded in those according to the Act and over which they have community ownership.